The global ocean has gone from infinite, wild, and thriving, to finite, fragile, and full of garbage. We have a limited amount of time to get people to pay attention, to anticipate change, to prepare for surprise, and to act for a more sustainable ocean future. This is why the United Nations has introduced a decade of ocean science for a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to strengthen the management of our ocean. But will it actually work? In today's episode, we will talk to Helen Orgram, Ambassador for the Oceans at the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Guillermo Otonio Crespo, a researcher at the Stockholm Resilience Centre, who is one of the leaders behind the UN Ocean Decade Early Career Ocean Professional Initiative. What impact do they think the ocean science decade will have? Is it just a vision, or can it really change the face of ocean science and practice? My name is Andrew Mary, and this is Rethink Talks. Welcome, Helen and Guillermo. It's wonderful to have both of you here today to talk about the UN Decade of Ocean Science. But I think before we start sort of cutting into the nitty gritty and really digging down into what this means and why it matters, I just wanted to ask, you know, each of you, and maybe starting with you, Helen, to share a little bit about why have you devoted yourself to the ocean? Why does it matter to you personally? Um, well, um, uh... Thank you for inviting me, first of all. Uh, it's nice to be here. And um, why am I engaged in the ocean? Um, I, I've been, ever since school, engaged in environmental issues in one way or the other. And I devoted my education to it and my career uh, in public administration. So I've been working with different um, uh, environmental issues like climate change, mm. uh, waste policies, and so on. Uh, and uh, I got the opportunity actually to work with ocean issues when Sweden were hosting the first UN Ocean Conference in mm. in 2017. Mm-hmm. So then it was new to me, but uh, now I'm uh, hooked, so to say. It's it's uh, a fantastic issue to work with. Thank you, Guillermo. For me, I guess it was a similar path as well. Since a very early age, I was hooked for some reason to the oceans. Um, and I had a very supporting family in Spain who allowed me to, to leave at an early age and go pursue a, a professional education on it. And um, yeah, that's been pretty much my, what's dictated where I move around the world for the last 10 years. I, I started with a, a bachelor's degree in marine biology, pursued a master's in ecosystem-based management. Um, I recently finished a PhD in the US on marine science and conservation. And through that process, I met some of the great people here at the Stockholm Brazilian Center, uh, where I'm based now, uh, doing my first postdoc. And uh, I mean, the, the oceans, we are at a critical time for the oceans, uh, not only in the context of climate change and food security. So it's a, it's a fascinating, fascinating moment to, to be devoted to this career path. So, and now we stand before the beginning of this UN ocean decade of, of science. And I sort of wanted to know like why why now and if you can give some a little bit of background as to sort of how we've gotten to this place and why you know why is now the right time for the ocean decade and where did it come from and of course the tagline of this is the science we need for the ocean we want um so if, as well as a bit of background it'd be great to say a bit about what what does that actually mean uh so maybe gillian you want to kick off this time sure um so i'm i'm not a, an expert on sort of uh, global sustainability challenges, but my sense of it is that we, through the Sustainable Development Goal Agenda, we've set ourselves some very ambitious goals for uh, to be met by uh, no, no later than 2030 across many topics. And one of them, Sustainable Development Goal 14, is, is focused on the oceans. And in order to turn the tide on a lot of these targets that we've set ourselves, we need to generate a lot more knowledge, uh, but not any type of knowledge, knowledge that is actionable and can be integrated into decision making. So the timeliness of the ocean decade is is huge to meet these um, these sustainability goals that we've we've set ourselves. So it's always important to generate knowledge, but in the context of sustainability, I think the ocean decade is uh, our, our our best last chance to generate knowledge towards sustainability action. Yeah, and, and um, also uh, in 2016, the first World Ocean Assessment was published, mm-hmm. and it really pointed to the 
serious decline in ocean health uh, and the many threats uh, that the ocean faces, everything from um, overfishing to acidification, deoxygenation, uh, and so on, uh, pollution, and it is, it's become very visible with the plastic pollution, with, which has also created more uh, or contributed to more public awareness because it suddenly gets visible what's happening. Uh, so uh, it's, it, uh, that also has raised the issue on the political level, and it's, it's a lot more political conversation now about how we can manage the ocean more sustainably. So, uh, and then of course, uh, we need uh, more science, uh, both the basic science about the chemical, uh, physical processes uh, of the ocean, the life in it, but also on innovations and, and uh, how we can improve management and, and um, uh, uh, make use of the resources in a truly sustainable way. Mm. And, and if I could just add, I think that your second question has to do with sort of the motto of the decade, which is the science we need for the for the ocean we want. And I think we could spend several hours just on that on that question because what is the ocean we want, and um, who who agrees, who decides what it it is that the direction that we're heading in, and it's something that we have to co-produce. And I think IUC UNESCO is doing a great job at kickstarting this decade by bringing all relevant voices on board uh, to collectively decide what, is, what, what ocean we want in, in, in the future. And it's something that will vary across geographic regions and, and generations and sectors. And uh, it's a very tricky conversation, but one that I think we have done a good job at, at starting these first two months of the, of the ocean decade. So it's really clear from both of your answers that there's a lot of different kinds of science that are going to need to be generated at the same time. Uh, and then they're going to need to be integrated and, and come to something which actually impacts uh, outcomes. So, Helen, is politics even ready to receive this kind of science? What what sort of structures are being built or or how is the science going to be taken into the process and actually be used? Because we all know as scientists it's often extremely frustrating to continually generate new knowledge but feel like it falls into a black hole. Is there something different about the, the ocean decade and the opportunity to really you know, make the science have impact? Yeah, I think um, I think the decade is is actually an opportunity to to build that bridge between science and and policy, and um, also for that part, increased awareness and and also business development. So uh, I think this is really an opportunity for us to to improve science, but also to make better use of it, uh, and. Um, uh, we have seen in the uh, uh, past years improvements in also uh, bridging science to policy gaps by different global initiatives. For example, uh, Norway and Palau has led the uh, high-level panel on, on a sustainable ocean economy, and they have been working hard with um, you know, uh, pulling together uh, recent science uh, and transforming it into policy recommendations. And we also see uh, initiatives like uh, uh, Friends of Ocean Action supported by the World Economic Forum that are also working a lot with uh, uh, linking the science to uh, policy and, and business development and improved sustainability in, in supply chains and so on. So uh, I think uh, we see a movement and, and we need to seize this opportunity to strengthen that movement. Uh, that's great to sort of bring up specific examples. But I mean, one thing, and this is I, I know quite often the case with UN sort of initiatives, but it's completely unfunded and has a really broad mandate. Um, what is actually then really realistic in terms of outcomes and, and can it actually change the face of ocean science? Well, uh, I think, uh, of course, uh, there is not uh, resources uh, allocated for the decade right now internationally. Mm -hmm. But then again, if you look at, for example, if we take Sweden, the government presented in December a research uh, bill uh, and in that bill, it's proposed to uh, that formas, uh, the research council, council formas, should uh, develop a, a new 10-year national research program on ocean and water. 
So in the bill, it suggested that the first four years, 210 million kroner are allocated uh, to this program. So at national level, uh, resources will be mobilized. Um, and uh, when we see increased political pressure, it will also get, gain more attention. So uh, I think a lot of things will happen if, if we all engage. Hmm. I, I would just add that, I mean, you're absolutely right, Andrew, that it is a, it's a huge mandate. It's a global decadal process um, and uh, it is unfunded. Uh, I do think that it will require some actors stepping up, and I'm really excited to see what Sweden does over the next 10 years in this context. But at the same time, uh, I think one of the, the, the key components to make this a successful decade is the integration of multiple voices that are not heard, and that is, you can do that for free. And that, if we if we look back from 2030, and we we have accomplished that, bringing the global community, global ocean community together, um, at, or at least given everyone the opportunity to, to express their opinion and have, give them a chance to integrate those thoughts and expertise into decision making, we will have, that will be a huge victory. And that doesn't require huge amounts of money. So I'm, I'm hopeful that some folks will step up. But again, a lot of stuff, great things can happen without uh, a huge check in hand. Yeah, and, and also uh, the future of, of the ocean also depends on on. Uh, uh, improved education and and to um, um, improve uh, ocean knowledge uh, in in the education system and that's not that's also something you can do with not too much uh, you know you have to change uh, a bit uh, the content of what you <laughs> what you teach and and so on but uh, there are a lot of uh, supporting system existing with museums and aquariums and and uh, the universities and, and think tanks and all kinds of resources that we could uh, draw upon. Great. So speaking of resources we can, we can draw on, uh, Guillermo, you're actually co-leading the UN Ocean Decade Early Career Ocean Professional Initiatives, uh, Initiative. Rather. So I'd, I'd really great to say a little bit more about what role do you see early career scientists having and, and how do you really want to kind of step forward and take a, a leadership role? Because often... Again, it's not always, sometimes young researchers have the best ideas, but they're not the ones with the loudest voices. Right. Uh, and that is something that, that um, I think my generation of early career ocean professionals recognizes. And um, I think the decade, and I don't say this lightly, I think the decade we will fail if we do not integrate the next generation of professionals into decision-making processes. We have some of the brightest ocean minds in my generation, but not only scientists, we're talking about anthropologists, we're talking about legal experts in the ocean context. And we are the fuel that will make sure that the decade runs and that persists after 2030. So for me, it's a no-brainer that we have to count on the next generation. We're not a box to check. We're not just young people who are also important have to be integrated but you know until you have professional training it's fair enough that you're not sat around the table as an equal uh you should you should be part of the conversation in other ways like we we see with some young activists but it takes time to teach uh a natural scientist like myself how intergovernmental processes work how industry operates and how decision making processes the logic behind them and so the sooner we can bring this next generation into the decade and other processes and, and, and sort of decision-making spaces, the more successful we'll be. Because if you have that sort of generational break, uh, whenever it's time to pass on the baton, you will have to start learning from scratch. So um, something that I would encourage um, IUC UNESCO to continue doing because they, they've done a good job so far is bring in a diversity of perspectives, including young professionals who, yes, have a little bit of learning to do, but like you said, also bring some of the most innovative ideas to the conversation. So one of the challenges, I think, that, you know, is is this, in some ways, kind of tension between the ocean as a sort of frontier of economic development uh, and, you know, the new opportunities for for industries and so forth, while at the same time realizing that the state of the ocean is degrading really fast and that we need to take urgent and dramatic action uh, to sort of, in many cases, restore or maintain the health of the oceans. So what does this mean in terms of like different states taking leadership roles? And, and can those that are sort of either directly or indirectly supportive of 
industries that are damaging the environment, can they actually take a leadership role? Like how do we address those kind of tensions from a policy perspective over the course of the decade? I, mean, I, I think that's a, a fa- million, million dollar question. It's a, the, the, the ocean is very, a very unique part of our planet from a governance standpoint. Um, it's a highly connected system. And so you cannot afford to just do a good job domestically, your national territory, your national waters. Um, But you have to engage with your neighbors. And sometimes in the context of marine pollution or climate change or migratory species, you may have to engage with actors um, across ocean basins. So your your success depends on others as much as it depends on on your own actions. So it's uh, it's in a way it's 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 humbling uh, that we unilateralism is not an option in this space. Yeah, and um, uh, when it comes to uh, countries taking uh, leadership uh, and still uh, uh, doing businesses or or engaged in activities that are still harmful, that is, um, uh, of course, that is possible. Mm. We see it (laughs) uh, already. And... and, uh, Um, no person or no state is either good or evil or black or white. It's it's a a, a continuous process that we need to get engaged in to to come uh, to to handle the uh, downsides of of our activities and improve uh, those and to to build on the uh, good and positive things. So it's it's a, a continuous iterative process, uh, and and also a very important process where we need uh, increased awareness and building political pressure and momentum. And and uh, you know you can have different methods with naming and shaming or uh, or engaging in dialogue and so on. Uh, and um, uh, eventually uh, we will uh, move further, but. Um, um, of course, it's it's a problem that we're in a hurry. And, and sometimes it, it feels like um, if your fleet or your national citizens or companies do not occupy that space or, or go, you know, catch that fish, someone else will do that. So uh, it does take courage for politicians to forego some amount of domestic productivity um, because it is let's say you want to give up, let's say, benthic trolling in this part of the ocean uh, because it's not sustainable when we've known for like 700 years. Well, another nation might go and do that same activity. So you're not, um, so it, it, it is a tricky situation. And like Helen was saying, we do need to build political consensus. And that's why the coalitions are so important. Yeah. And sometimes also uh, a change can come with only one person. So you shouldn't underestimate the power of, of individuals. Uh, I mean, uh, we have seen um, uh, Swedish uh, leadership in, in uh, global ocean affairs and uh, uh, Isabella Levine, uh, our former uh, deputy prime minister, and, and she has had different ministerial posts. She has been uh, a leading figure. And that, that is uh, also because, uh, I mean, Sweden has a long legacy of, of uh, environmental and um, engagement uh, and also for sustainable development. But uh, individuals like Isabella, for example, has really raised the issue. And and we see now as an opportunity with uh, John Kerry being the uh, presidential climate envoy, um, uh, he has also a strong ocean uh, engagement. uh, And he he initiated our ocean conferences to to, uh, um, pull together uh, uh, ministers for foreign affairs and, and decision makers to, to, to uh, engage in ocean uh, improvement. So uh, it, it's also a matter of seizing the moment when, when you have leaders in place uh, with strong commitments uh, and engagement. Mm. Yeah, so in that sense, the UN Ocean Decade is very much primed for uh, hopefully having a lot of impact and success and and of course it can help to drive a lot of the collective action and sort of build on things that are already happening and and I think that's really exciting. Helen, what do you want and need from science over the course of this decade? And then I would ask uh, the opposite question to you, Guillermo, what do you want and need from policy? Well, the, as we talked about in the beginning of the conversation, there are so many areas where we need more science. Uh, 
but what I think is important also to to uh, have uh, scientific institutions and the universities um, uh, to take the third mission uh, really seriously. The third mission of the the uh, research communities is is uh, to um, uh, communicate the results. So I think we need also to think about that, how to, um, you know, uh, aggregate data and to synthesize the research uh, to, to make it uh, digestible for, for decision makers uh, who, who don't have time actually to, to read all the scientific reports. So it's a, it's a crucial issue. So um, I think that in the decade, uh, also some focus on, on communication skills mm. and, uh, and uh, journalism, uh, uh, improved knowledge among uh, journalists about the ocean is, is um, uh, also a key. Um, I would say that if, you, if we want to develop actionable knowledge on the ocean, it, it requires generating knowledge over multiple years. Uh, the ocean is a, a space that we have to understand over multi, yeah, a, a longer time frame because there's multiple processes that act inter, in, at interannual scale. So th that is to say long-term funding and some degree of stability uh, as a researcher is fundamental because we do invest a lot of time in uh, writing grants for six months or one year or 18 months. and. Um, having that sort of peace of mind that we are funded for a longer time frame uh, can really allow for us to go not only wide but also deep into a topic and and really um, deliver the the knowledge that is needed. And the other side of things related to what Helen was saying on on communication, if you're not a scientist that is part of an, a big IGO or government delegation, some intergovernmental processes are are fenced off to you. We we have we rely on governments and some uh, of the negotiating parties, let's say in the Southern Ocean, the high seas negotiations for a new treaty to bring that knowledge into the conversation. We cannot just show up as, you know, Guillermo from SRC and I have, I'm an expert in high seas ecology and I'm here to, it doesn't work like that. So having strategic allies and governments that can help bring us into the conversation when, it, when we are required, not all the time, I think that um, doing that more often is great because I feel like in some of these processes, whether it's high seas or the SDGs, some of the brightest minds on those topics are locked in academia and are not engaging with the decision makers as often. So, um, yeah, so bringing delegate, uh, scientists and delegations when it's pertinent would be would be great. Yeah, and we also see uh, some interesting partnerships uh, growing with uh, with the. Um sort of uh, cooperation between scientists, uh, civil society, governments, uh, and businesses. So that is also important to, to keep that conversation uh, and to, to, uh, uh, for researchers to engage in such initiatives uh, to, uh, to inform uh, uh, other type of uh, decision makers. Mm. And maybe that's a new role that perhaps the scientific community is now only just beginning to embrace. Like, how do we engage with, well, like you were saying, different types of decision makers that are maybe 30 years ago in the traditional academic sense, it wasn't as often. But um, science is not a, is a tool that has to be used properly in the right context. And some and that context is not the academic bubble. We have to get out of, out of our cocoons and, and take, a, in a way, a risk uh, and say and, and prove that our science can be equally as robust whether we engage with civil society or industry or governments. Yeah, it takes courage, but it's an exciting opportunity. So one final question for both of you. No matter who this person is, whether they're a business leader, an entrepreneur, a high school student, a teacher, whoever they might be, if you had a very short period of time just to tell them why they should care about the ocean decade, why it should matter to them and why they should engage in whatever way they can, no matter what their skills are or what capacities they have, what would you say to them? Why, why does this really matter and why does it matter now? If we, this is our, like I said earlier, our last best chance to protect a system on which we depend on to the extent that we can't even imagine for food security, for job security, for climate. Um, and whether you are directly connected to 
solution or you, or you have an interest or a passion and you have a different profession. Um, we will look back at this decade and wish that we had been more committed and we had done more work. So if you think it doesn't affect you, think twice. If you think it doesn't affect your sector or the livelihood of your community, think twice. Uh, this is the time to, to learn. Uh, this is a whole decade of learning. We are all trying to learn something we don't know. Um, so become engaged at whatever level you can. But uh, yeah, this is the, the ocean is something we've been ignoring for far too long. And this is our chance to get it right. So um, it, reach out and, and, and learn because uh, probably your, your livelihood and your sector depends on a healthy ocean. And, and we're going the opposite way right now. So we have to do something about it. Yeah, uh, it's difficult to to uh, say uh, anything more <laughs> after that. Uh, I mean, it was so uh, good summarized by you, Guillermo. But uh, if I uh, just could uh, give you a, a, a suggestion, if you if you want to be motivated, so. Um, uh, I, I could recommend everyone to see the film My Octopus Teacher, produced by uh, Craig Foster. Uh, every day for one year, he dives into the South African uh, kelp forest without tubes and in freezing water uh, to see the creatures living there in their own environment and to see the ecosystem and interdependencies of the different species. And he actually get, uh, becomes friend, you could say, with an octopus and interact interacts with a wild octopus. So seeing that film, it, it teaches you a lot of things. First of all, that, that there are intelligent and fascinating creatures that know and have strategies far beyond what we have imagined, but also um, uh, about the ecosystem and the um, sort of cycle of life. Uh, um, so to say. So it's a, a fascinating film and it might inspire you to, to learn more and to engage in preserving what we have. Thanks to both of you. And I look forward to the follow-up episode in five years when we're halfway through the UN Ocean Decade and we can report on our cr incredible success in both science and policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Rethink Talks, a podcast produced by the Stockholm Resilience Centre at Stockholm University. For more info, head over to our website at rethink.earth and don't forget to subscribe.